some have seen the veil of existence lifted, and wonders upon wonders opened before their mind's eye. They call this seeing the great god Pan. Now, Dr. Raymond will attempt to lift the veil again, surgically. Arthur Mackin, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Many, many thanks to our financial supporters who pitch in every month to help us keep the lights on. If you enjoy the show, please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a coupon code every month as a thank you. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. The Crystal Stopper, the fifth installment in the Arsène Lupin series, is now available at classictalesaudiobooks.com. The fourth installment, 813, was recently reviewed by Audiophile magazine. You can pick up 813 and The Crystal Stopper by visiting the links in the details for this week's episode. And now for something completely different. Welsh writer Arthur Macken pioneered the world of Gothic fiction, spanning the distance between Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft. This particular work of classic horror is instrumental in employing the triggering device of occultism, as well as using several different points of view to build a story. The use of various letters to build a cohesive narrative was also used by Victorian authors Wilkie Collins in The Moonstone, Bram Stoker in Dracula, and later by H.P. Lovecraft in The Call of Cthulhu. The concept of a veil that is lifted to reveal a world elsewhere is also a common Victorian story device, as used by George Eliot in The Lifted Veil. Macken moved them all forward. First published in 1890, it is interesting to consider that when the story's editor, Clark, is compiling his volume of proof of the existence of the devil, he assiduously refrains from using published works. In the compiling of his theory, the use of unpublished works is far more valuable to make his point absolutely clear. And now, The Great God Pan, Part 1 of 3, by Arthur Mackin. One, the experiment. I am glad you came, Clark. Very glad indeed. I was not sure you could spare the time. I was able to make arrangements for a few days. Things are not very lively just now. But have you no misgivings, Raymond? Is it absolutely safe? The two men were slowly pacing the terrace in front of Dr. Raymond's house. The sun still hung above the western mountain line, but it shone with a dull red glow that cast no shadows, and all the air was quiet. A sweet breath came from the great wood on the hillside above, and with it, at intervals, the soft murmuring call of the wild doves. Below, in the long lovely valley, the river wound in and out between the lonely hills and as the sun hovered and vanished into the west, a faint mist, pure white, began to rise from the hills. Dr. Raymond turned sharply to his friend. Safe? Of course it is. In itself, the operation is a perfectly simple one. Any surgeon could do it. There is no danger at any other stage? None. Absolutely no physical danger whatsoever. I give you my word. You are always timid, Clark, always. But you know my history. I have devoted myself to transcendental medicine for the last twenty years. I have heard myself called quack and charlatan and impostor, 
but all the while I knew I was on the right path. Five years ago I reached the goal, and since then every day has been a preparation for what we shall do tonight. I should like to believe it is all true. Clark knit his brows and looked doubtfully at Dr. Raymond. Are you perfectly sure, Raymond, that your theory is not a phantasmagoria? A splendid vision, certainly, but a mere vision, after all? Dr. Raymond stopped in his walk and turned sharply. He was a middle-aged man, gaunt and thin, of a pale yellow complexion. But as he answered Clark and faced him, there was a flush on his cheek. Look about you, Clark. You see the mountain and hill following after hill, as wave on wave, and you see the woods and orchard, the fields of ripe corn, and the meadows reaching to the reed beds by the river. You see me, standing here beside you, and hear my voice. But I tell you, that all these things, yes, from that star that has just shone out in the sky, to the solid ground beneath our feet, I say that all these are but dreams and shadows. The shadows that hide the real world from our eyes. There is a real world. But it is beyond this glamour and this vision, beyond these chases and arras, dreams in a career, beyond them all as beyond a veil. I do not know whether any human being has ever lifted that veil, but I do know, Clark, that you and I shall see it lifted this very night from before another's eyes. You may think this all strange nonsense. It may be strange, but it is true, and the ancients knew what lifting the veil means. They called it seeing the god Pan. Clark shivered. The white mist gathering over the river was chilly. It is wonderful indeed, he said. We are standing on the brink of a strange world, Raymond, if what you say is true. I suppose the knife is absolutely necessary? Yes. A slight lesion in the grey matter, that is all. A trifling rearrangement of certain cells— a microscopical alteration that would escape the attention of ninety-nine brain specialists out of a hundred. I don't want to bother you with shop, Clark. I might give you a mass of technical detail, which would sound very imposing, and would leave you as enlightened as you are now. But I suppose you have read, casually, in out-of-the-way corners of your paper, that immense strides have been made recently in the physiology of the brain. I saw a paragraph the other day about Digby's theory and Brown Faber's discoveries. Theories and discoveries. Where they are standing now, I stood fifteen years ago. And I need not tell you that I have not been standing still for the last fifteen years. It will be enough if I say that five years ago I made the discovery that I alluded to when I said that ten years ago I reached the goal. After years of labour, after years of toiling and groping in the dark, after days and nights of disappointments and sometimes of despair, in which I used now and then to tremble and grow cold with the thought that perhaps there were others seeking for what I sought, at last, after so long, a pang of sudden joy thrilled my soul, and I knew the long journey was at an end. But what seemed then, and still seems a chance, the suggestion of a moment's idle thought, followed up upon familiar lines and paths that I had tracked a hundred times already, the great truth burst upon me, and I saw, mapped out in lines of sight, a whole world, a sphere unknown, continents and islands, and great oceans, in which no ship has sailed, to my belief, since a man first lifted up his eyes and beheld the sun and the stars of heaven and the quiet earth beneath. You will think this all high-flown language, Clark, but it is hard to be literal, and yet 
I do not know whether what I am hinting at cannot be set forth in plain and lonely terms. For instance, this world of ours is pretty well girded now with the telegraph wires and cables. Thought, with something less than the speed of thought, flashes from sunrise to sunset, from north to south, across the floods and the desert places. Suppose that an electrician of today were suddenly to perceive that he and his friends have merely been playing with pebbles and mistaking them for the foundations of the world. Suppose that such a man saw uttermost space lie open before the current, and words of men flash forth to the sun and beyond the sun, into the systems beyond, and the voice of articulate speaking men echo in the waste void that bounds our thought. As analogies go, that is a pretty good analogy of what I have done. You can understand now a little of what I felt as I stood here one evening. It was a summer evening, and the valley looked much as it does now. I stood here and saw before me the unutterable, the unthinkable gulf that yawns profound between two worlds, the world of matter and the world of spirit. I saw the great empty deep stretch dim before me, and in that instant a bridge of light leapt from the earth to the unknown shore, and the abyss was spanned. You may look in Brown Faber's book, if you like, and you will find that, to the present day, men of science are unable to account for the presence, or to specify the functions of a certain group of nerve cells in the brain. That group is, as it were, land to let, a mere waste place for fanciful theories. I am not in the position of Brown Faber and the specialists. I am perfectly instructed as to the possible functions of those nerve centres in the scheme of things. With a touch, I can bring them into play. With a touch, I say, I can set free the current with a touch. I can complete the communication between this world of sense and... We shall be able to finish the sentence later on. Yes, the knife is necessary. But think what that knife will effect. It will level utterly the solid wall of sense. And probably, for the first time since man was made, a spirit will gaze on a spirit world. Clark, Mary will see the god Pan. But you remember what you wrote to me? I thought it would be requisite that she... He whispered the rest into the doctor's ear. Not at all, not at all. That is nonsense, I assure you, indeed. It is better as it is. I am quite certain of that. Consider the matter well, Raymond. It's a great responsibility. Something might go wrong. You would be a miserable man for the rest of your days. No, I think not. Even if the worst happened. As you know, I rescued Mary from the gutter, and from almost certain starvation when she was a child. I think her life is mine, to use as I see fit. Come, it's getting late. We had better go in. Dr. Raymond led the way into the house through the hall, and down a long, dark passage. He took a key from his pocket and opened a heavy door and motioned Clark into his laboratory. It had once been a billiard room and was lighted by a glass dome in the center of the ceiling, whence there still shone a sad gray light on the figure of the doctor as he lit a lamp with a heavy shade and placed it on a table in the middle of the room. Clark looked about him. Scarcely a foot of wall remained bare. There were shelves all around, laden with bottles and vials of all shapes and colors, and at one end stood a little Chippendale bookcase. Raymond pointed to this. You see that parchment, Oswald Crolius? He was one of the first to show me the way, though I don't think he ever found it himself. That is a strange saying of his, in every grain of wheat there lies hidden the soul of a star. 
There was not much furniture in the laboratory. The table in the center, a stone slab with a drain in one corner, the two armchairs on which Raymond and Clark were sitting, and that was all, except an odd-looking chair at the furthest end of the room. Clark looked at it and raised his eyebrows. Yes, that is the chair, said Raymond. We may as well place it in position. He got up and wheeled the chair to the light and began raising and lowering it, letting down the seat, setting the back at various angles and adjusting the footrest. It looked comfortable enough, and Clark passed his hand over the soft green velvet as the doctor manipulated the lovers. Now, Clark, make yourself quite comfortable. I have a couple hours' work before me. I was obliged to leave certain matters to the last. Raymond went to the stone slab, and Clark watched him drearily, as he bent over a row of vials and lit the flame under the crucible. The doctor had a small hand lamp, shaded as the larger one, on a ledge above his apparatus, and Clark, who sat in the shadows, looked down at the great shadowy room, wondering at the bizarre effects of brilliant light and undefined darkness contrasting with one another. Soon he became conscious of an odd odor, at first the merest suggestion of odor in the room, and as it grew more decided, he felt surprised that he was not reminded of the chemist's shop or the surgery. Clark found himself idly endeavoring to analyze the sensation, and half conscious, he began to think of a day fifteen years ago that he had spent roaming through the woods and meadows near his own home. It was a burning day at the beginning of August. The heat had dimmed the outlines of all things and all distances with a faint mist, and people who observed the thermometer spoke of an abnormal register of a temperature that was almost tropical. Strangely, that wonderful hot day of the fifties rose up again in Clark's imagination. The sense of dazzling, all-pervading sunlight seemed to blot out the shadows and the lights of the laboratory, and he felt again the heated air beating in gusts about his face, saw the shimmer rising from the turf, and heard the myriad murmur of the summer. I hope the smell doesn't annoy you, Clark. There's nothing unwholesome about it. It may make you a bit sleepy, that's all. Clark heard the words quite distinctly, and knew that Raymond was speaking to him, but for the life of him he could not rouse himself from his lethargy. He could only think of the lonely walk he had taken fifteen years ago. It was his last look at the fields and woods he had known since he was a child and now it all stood out in brilliant light as a picture before him. Above all, there came to his nostrils the scent of summer, the smell of flowers mingled, and the odor of the woods, of cool shaded places, deep in the green depths, drawn forth by the sun's heat, and the scent of the good earth, lying, as it were, with arms stretched forth and smiling lips, overpowered all. His fancies made him wander, as he had wandered long ago, from the fields into the wood, tracking a little path between the shining undergrowth of beech trees and the trickle of water dropping from the limestone rock sounded as a clear melody in the dream. Thoughts began to go astray and to mingle with other thoughts. The beech alley was transformed to a path between ilex trees, and here and there a vine climbed from bough to bough and sent up waving tendrils and drooped with purple grapes, and the sparse gray-green leaves of a wild olive tree stood out against the dark shadows of the ilex. Clark, in the deep folds of dream, was conscious that the path from his father's house had led him into an undiscovered country and he was wondering at the strangeness of it all, when suddenly, in place of the hum and murmur of the summer, an infinite silence seemed to fall on all things, and the wood was hushed, and for a moment in time, 
he stood face to face there with a presence. There was neither man nor beast, neither the living nor the dead, but all things mingled. The form of all things, but devoid of all form. And in that moment, the sacrament of body and soul was dissolved, and a voice seemed to cry, Let us go hence. And then the darkness of darkness beyond the stars, the darkness of everlasting. When Clark woke up with a start, he saw Raymond pouring a few drops of some oily fluid into a green file, which he stoppered tightly. You have been dozing, he said. The journey must have tired you out. It is done now. I am going to fetch Mary. I shall be back in ten minutes. Clark lay back in his chair and wondered. It seemed as if he had but passed from one dream into another. He half expected to see the walls of the laboratory melt and disappear, and to awake in London, shuddering at his own sleeping fancies. But at last the door opened, and the doctor returned, and behind him came a girl of about seventeen, dressed all in white. She was so beautiful that Clark did not wonder at what the doctor had written to him. She was blushing now over face and neck and arms, but Raymond seemed unmoved. Mary, he said, the time has come. You are quite free. Are you willing to trust yourself to me entirely? Yes, dear. Do you hear that, Clark? You are my witness. Here is the chair, Mary. It is quite easy. Just sit in it and lean back. Are you ready? Yes, dear. Quite ready. Give me a kiss before you begin. The doctor stooped and kissed her mouth, kindly enough. Now shut your eyes, he said. The girl closed her eyelids, as if she were tired and longed for sleep, and Raymond placed the green file to her nostrils. Her face grew white, whiter than her dress. She struggled, faintly, and then with the feeling of submission strong within her, crossed her arms upon her breast as a little child about to say her prayers. The bright light of the lamp fell full upon her, and Clark watched changes fleeting over her face as the changes of the hills when the summer clouds float across the sun. And then she lay all white and still, and the doctor turned up one of her eyelids. She was quite unconscious. Raymond pressed hard on one of the levers, and the chair instantly sank back. Clark saw him cutting away a circle like a tonsure from her hair, and the lamp was moved nearer. Raymond took a small, glittering instrument from a little case, and Clark turned away shudderingly. When he looked again, the doctor was binding up the wound he had made. She will awake in five minutes. Raymond was still perfectly cool. There is nothing more to be done. We can only wait. The minutes passed slowly. They could hear a slow, heavy ticking. There was an old clock in the passage. Clark felt sick and faint. His knees shook beneath him. He could hardly stand. Suddenly, as they watched, they heard a long, drawn sigh. And suddenly did the color that had vanished return to the girl's cheeks. And suddenly her eyes opened. Clark quailed before them. They shone with an awful light, looking far away, and a great wonder fell upon her face, and her hands stretched out as if to touch what was invisible. But in an instant, the wonder faded and gave place to the most awful terror. The muscles of her face were hideously convulsed. She shook from head to foot, the soul seemed struggling and shuddering within the house of flesh. It was a horrible sight, and Clark rushed forward as she fell shrieking to the floor. Three days later, Raymond took Clark to Mary's bedside. She was lying wide awake, rolling her head from side to side and grinning vacantly. 
Yes, said the doctor, still quite cool. It is a great pity. She is a hopeless idiot. However, it could not be helped, and after all, she has seen the great god Pan. 2. Mr. Clark's Memoirs Mr. Clark, the gentleman chosen by Dr. Raymond to witness the strange experiment of the god Pan, was a person in whose character caution and curiosity were oddly mingled. In his sober moments, he thought of the unusual and eccentric with undisguised aversion. And yet, deep in his heart, there was a wide-eyed inquisitiveness with respect to all the more recondite and esoteric elements in the nature of men. The latter tendency had prevailed when he accepted Raymond's invitation, for though his considered judgment has always repudiated the doctor's theories as the wildest nonsense, yet he secretly hugged a belief in fantasy, and would have rejoiced to see that belief confirmed. The horrors that he witnessed in the dreary laboratory were to a certain extent salutary. He was conscious of being involved in an affair not altogether reputable, and for many years afterwards he clung bravely to the commonplace and rejected all occasions of occult investigation. Indeed, on some homeopathic principle, he for some time attended the seances of distinguished mediums, hoping that the clumsy tricks of these gentlemen would make him altogether disgusted with mysticism of every kind. But the remedy, though caustic, was not efficacious. Clark knew that he still pined for the unseen, and little by little the old passion began to reassert itself, as the face of Mary, shuddering and convulsed with an unknown terror, faded slowly from his memory. Occupied all day in pursuits both serious and lucrative, the temptation to relax in the evening was too great, especially in the winter months, when the fire cast a warm glow over his snug bachelor apartment, and a bottle of some choice claret stood ready at his elbow. His dinner digested, he would make a brief pretense of reading the evening paper, but the mere catalogue of news soon palled upon him and Clark would find himself casting glances of warm desire in the direction of an old Japanese bureau, which stood at a pleasant distance from the hearth. Like a boy before a jam closet, for a few minutes he would hover indecisive, but lust always prevailed, and Clark ended by drawing up his chair, lighting a candle, and sitting down before the bureau. Its pigeonholes and drawers teemed with documents on the most morbid subjects, and in the well reposed a large manuscript volume, in which he had painfully entered the gems of his collection. Clark had a fine contempt for published literature. The most ghostly story ceased to interest him if it happened to be printed. His sole pleasure was in the reading, compiling, and rearranging what he called his Memoirs to prove the existence of the devil. And engaged in this pursuit, the evening seemed to fly, and the night appeared too short. On one particular evening, an ugly December night, black with fog and raw with frost, Clark hurried over his dinner and scarcely deigned to observe his customary ritual of taking up the paper and laying it down again. He paced two or three times up and down the room and opened the bureau, stood still a moment, and sat down. He leaned back, absorbed in one of those dreams to which he was subject, and at length drew out his book and opened it at the last entry. There were three or four pages densely covered with Clark's round, set penmanship, and at the beginning he had written in a somewhat larger hand Singular narrative told me by my friend, Dr. Phillips. He assures me that all the facts related therein are strictly and wholly true, but refuses to give either the surnames of the persons concerned or the place where these extraordinary events occurred. Mr. Clark began to read over the account for the tenth time, 
glancing now and then at the pencil notes he had made when it was told him by his friend. It was one of his humors to pride himself on a certain literary ability. He thought well of his style, and took pains in arranging the circumstances in dramatic order. He read the following story. The persons concerned in this statement are Helen V., who, if she is still alive, must now be a woman of twenty-three, Rachel M., since deceased, who was a year younger than the above, and Trevor W., an imbecile, aged eighteen. These persons were at the period of the story inhabitants of a village on the borders of Wales, a place of some importance in the time of the Roman occupation, but now a scattered hamlet of not more than five hundred souls. It is situated on rising ground, about six miles from the sea, and is sheltered by a large and picturesque forest. Some eleven years ago, Helen V. came to the village under rather peculiar circumstances. It is understood that she, being an orphan, was adopted in her infancy by a distant relative, who brought her up in his own house until she was twelve years old. Thinking, however, that it would be better for the child to have playmates of her own age, he advertised in several local papers for a good home in a comfortable farmhouse for a girl of twelve, and this advertisement was answered by Mr. R., a well-to-do farmer in the above-mentioned village. His references proving satisfactory, the gentleman sent his adopted daughter to Mr. R. with a letter, in which he stipulated that the girl should have a room to herself, and stated that her guardians need be at no trouble in the matter of education, as she was already sufficiently educated for the position in life which she would occupy. In fact, Mr. R. was given to understand that the girl be allowed to find her own occupations, and to spend her time almost as she liked. Mr. R. duly met her at the nearest station, a town seven miles away from his house, and seems to have remarked nothing extraordinary about the child, except that she was reticent as to her former life and her adopted father. She was, however, of a very different type from the inhabitants of the village. Her skin was a pale, clear olive, and her features were strongly marked, and of a somewhat foreign character. She appears to have settled down easily enough into farmhouse life, and became a favourite with the children, who sometimes went with her on her rambles in the forest, for this was her amusement. Mr. R. states that he has known her to go out by herself directly after their early breakfast, and not return till after dusk, and that, feeling uneasy at a young girl being out alone for so many hours, he communicated with her adopted father, who replied in a brief note that Helen must do as she chose. In the winter, when the forest paths are impassable, she spent most of her time in her bedroom, where she slept alone, according to the instructions of her relative. It was on one of these expeditions to the forest that the first of the singular incidents with which this girl is connected occurred, the date being about a year after her arrival at the village. The preceding winter had been remarkably severe, the snow drifting to a great depth, and the frost continuing for an unexampled period, and the summer following was as noteworthy for its extreme heat. On one of the very hottest days in the summer, Helen V. left the farmhouse for one of her long rambles in the forest, taking with her, as usual, some bread and meat for lunch. She was seen by some men in the fields making for the old Roman road, a green causeway which traverses the highest part of the wood, and they were astonished to observe that the girl had taken off her hat, though the heat of the sun was already tropical. As it happened, a labourer, Joseph W. by name, was working in the forest near the Roman road, and at twelve o'clock his little son, Trevor, brought the man his dinner of bread and cheese. After the meal, the boy, who was about seven years old at the time, left his father at work, and, as he said, went to look for flowers in the wood, and the man, who could hear him shouting with delight at his discoveries, felt no uneasiness. Suddenly, however, he was horrified at hearing the most dreadful screams, evidently the result of great terror, 
proceeding from the direction in which his son had gone, and he hastily threw down his tools and ran to see what had happened. Tracing his path by the sound, he met the little boy, who was running headlong and was evidently terribly frightened, and on questioning him, the man elicited that after picking a posy of flowers, he felt tired, and lay down on the grass and fell asleep. He was suddenly awakened, as he stated, by a peculiar noise, a sort of singing, he called it, and on peeping through the branches, he saw Helen V. playing on the grass with a strange naked man, who he seemed unable to describe more fully. He said he felt dreadfully frightened and ran away crying for his father. Joseph W. proceeded in the direction indicated by his son, and found Helen V. sitting on the grass in the middle of a glade or open space left by charcoal burners. He angrily charged her with frightening his little boy, but she entirely denied the accusation and laughed at the child's story of a strange man, to which he himself did not attach much credence. Joseph W. came to the conclusion that the boy had woke up with a sudden fright, as children sometimes do. But Trevor persisted in his story, and continued in such evident distress that at last his father took him home, hoping that his mother would be able to soothe him. For many weeks, however, the boy gave his parents much anxiety. He became nervous and strange in his manner, refusing to leave the cottage by himself, and constantly alarming the household by waking in the night with cries of, The man in the wood! Father! Father! In course of time, however, the impression seemed to have worn off, and about three months later he accompanied his father to the home of a gentleman in the neighbourhood, for whom Joseph W. occasionally did work. The man was shown into the study, and the little boy was left sitting in the hall, and a few minutes later, while the gentleman was giving W. his instructions, they were both horrified by a piercing shriek and the sound of a fall, and rushing out, they found the child lying senseless on the floor, his face contorted with terror. The doctor was immediately summoned, and after some examination he pronounced the child to be suffering from a kind of fit, apparently produced by a sudden shock. The boy was taken to one of the bedrooms, and after some time recovered consciousness, but only to pass into a condition described by the medical man as one of violent hysteria. The doctor exhibited a strong sedative, and in the course of two hours pronounced him fit to walk home, but in passing through the hall the paroxysms of fright returned, and with additional violence. The father perceived that the child was pointing at some object, and heard the old cry, The man in the wood! and, looking in the direction indicated, saw a stone head of grotesque appearance, which had been built into the wall above one of the doors. It seems the owner of the house had recently made alterations in his premises, and on digging the foundations for some offices, the men had found a curious head, evidently of the Roman period, which had been placed in the manner described. The head is pronounced by the most experienced archaeologists of the district to be that of a fawn or satyr. Dr. Phillips tells me that he has seen the head in question, and assures me that he has never received such a vivid presentment of intense evil. From whatever cause arising, this second shock seemed too severe for the boy Trevor, and at the present date he suffers from a weakness of intellect, which gives but little promise of amending. The matter caused a good deal of sensation at the time, and the girl Helen was closely questioned by Mr. R., but to no purpose, she steadfastly denying that she had frightened or in any way molested Trevor. The second event with which this girl's name is connected took place about six years ago, and is of a still more extraordinary character. At the beginning of the summer of 1882, Helen contracted a friendship of a peculiarly intimate character with Rachel M., the daughter of a prosperous farmer in the neighbourhood. This girl, who was a year younger than Helen, was considered by most people to be the prettier of the two, though Helen's features had to a great extent softened as she became older. The two girls, who were together on every available opportunity, presented a singular contrast. 
the one with her clear olive skin and almost Italian appearance, and the other of the proverbial red and white of our rural districts. It must be stated that the payments made to Mr. R. for the maintenance of Helen were known in the village for their excessive liberality, and the impression was general that she would one day inherit a large sum of money from her relative. The parents of Rachel were therefore not averse from their daughter's friendship with the girl, and even encouraged the intimacy, though they now bitterly regret having done so. Helen still retained her extraordinary fondness for the forest, and on several occasions Rachel accompanied her, the two friends setting out early in the morning and remaining in the wood until dusk. Once or twice after these excursions, Mrs. M. thought her daughter's manner rather peculiar. She seemed languid and dreamy, and as it has been expressed, different from herself. But these peculiarities seemed to have been thought too trifling for remark. One evening, however, after Rachel had come home, her mother heard a noise, which sounded like suppressed weeping in the girl's room, and on going in found her lying half undressed upon the bed, evidently in the greatest distress. As soon as she saw her mother, she exclaimed, Ah, oh, mother, mother, why did you let me go to the forest with Helen? Mrs. M. was astonished at so strange a question and proceeded to make inquiries. Rachel told her a wild story. She said, Clark closed the book with a snap and turned his chair towards the fire. When his friend sat one evening in that very chair and told his story, Clark had interrupted him at a point a little subsequent to this, had cut short his words in a paroxysm of horror. My God! he had exclaimed. Think! Think what you are saying. It is too incredible, too monstrous. Such things can never be in this quiet world, where men and women live and die and struggle and conquer, or maybe fail, and fall down under sorrow, and grieve and suffer strange fortunes for many a year. But not this, Phillips. Not such things as this. There must be some explanation, some way out of the terror. Why, man! If such a case were possible, our earth would be a nightmare. But Phillips had told his story to the end, concluding, Her flight remains a mystery to this day. She vanished in broad sunlight. They saw her walking in the meadow, and a few moments later she was not there. Clark tried to conceive the thing again as he sat by the fire and again his mind shuddered and shrank back, appalled before the sight of such awful, unspeakable elements enthroned, as it were, and triumphant in human flesh. Before him stretched the long, dim vista of the green causeway in the forest, as his friend had described it. He saw the swaying leaves and the quivering shadows on the grass. He saw the sunlight in the flowers, and far away, Far in the long distance, the two figures moved toward him. One was Rachel, but the other? Clark had tried his best to disbelieve it all, but at the end of the account, as he had written it in his book, he had placed the inscription, Et diabolus incarnat est, et homo factus est, and the devil is incarnate, and he was made man. 3. The City of Resurrections Herbert! Good God, is it possible? Yes, my name's Herbert. I think I know your face, too, but I don't remember your name. My memory is very queer. Don't you recollect Villiers of Wadham? So it is. So it is. I beg your pardon, Villiers. I didn't think I was begging of an old college friend. Good night. My dear fellow, this haste is unnecessary. My rooms are close by, but we won't go there just yet. Suppose we walk up to Shaftesbury Avenue a little way. But how in heaven's name have you come to this pass, Herbert? It's a long story, Villiers. And a strange one, too. But you can hear it, if you like. 
Come on, then. Take my arm. You don't seem very strong. The ill-assorted pair moved slowly up Rupert Street, the one in dirty, evil-looking rags, and the other retired in the regulation uniform of a man about town, trim, glossy, and eminently well-to-do. Villiers had emerged from his restaurant after an excellent dinner of many courses, assisted by an ingratiating little flask of Chianti, and in that frame of mind which was with him almost chronic, had delayed a moment by the door, peering round in the dimly lighted street in search of those mysterious incidents and persons with which the streets of London teem in every quarter and every hour. Villiers prided himself as a practised explorer of such obscure mazes and byways of London life, and in this unprofitable pursuit he displayed an assiduity which was worthy of more serious employment. Thus, he stood by the lamppost, surveying the passers-by with undisguised curiosity, and with that gravity known only to the systematic diner, had just enunciated in his mind the formula London has been called the City of Encounters. It is more than that. It is the City of Resurrections. When these reflections were suddenly interrupted by a piteous whine at his elbow and a deplorable appeal for alms. He looked around in some irritation and with a sudden shock found himself confronted with the embodied proof of his somewhat stilted fancies. There, close beside him, his face altered and disfigured by poverty and disgrace, his body barely covered by greasy, ill-fitting rags, stood his old friend Charles Herbert, who had matriculated on the same day as himself, with whom he had been merry and wise for twelve revolving terms. Different occupations and varying interests had interrupted the friendship, and it was six years since Villiers had seen Herbert. And now, he looked upon this wreck of a man with grief and dismay, mingled with a certain inquisitiveness as to what dreary chain of circumstances had dragged him down to such a doleful pass. Villiers felt, together with compassion, all the relish of the amateur in mysteries, and congratulated himself on his leisurely speculations outside the restaurant. They walked on in silence for some time and more than one passer-by stared in astonishment at the unaccustomed spectacle of a well-dressed man with an unmistakable beggar hanging on to his arm. And observing this, Villiers led the way to an obscure street in Soho. Here he repeated his question. How on earth has it happened, Herbert? I always understood you would succeed to an excellent position in Dorsetshire. Did your father disinherit you? Surely not. No, Villiers, I came into all the property at my poor father's death. He died a year after I left Oxford. He was a very good father to me, and I mourned his death sincerely enough. But you know what young men are. A few months later I came up to town and went a good deal into society. Of course I had excellent introductions, and I managed to enjoy myself very much in a harmless sort of way. I played a little, certainly, but never for heavy stakes, and the few bets I made on races brought me in money, only a few pounds, you know, but enough to pay for cigars and such petty pleasures. It was in my second season that the tide turned. Of course, you have heard of my marriage. No, I never heard anything about it. Yes, I married, Villiers. I met a girl, a girl of the most wonderful and most strange beauty, at the house of some people whom I knew. I cannot tell you her age. I never knew it. But so far as I can guess, I should think she must have been about nineteen when I made her acquaintance. My friends had come to know her at Florence. She told them she was an orphan, the child of an English father and an Italian mother, and she charmed them as she charmed me. The first time I saw her, was at an evening party. I was standing by the door, talking to a friend, when suddenly, above the hum and babble of conversation, I heard a voice which seemed to thrill to my heart. She was singing an Italian song. I was introduced to her that evening. 
and in three months I married Helen. Villiers, that woman, if I can call her woman, corrupted my soul. The night of the wedding I found myself sitting in her bedroom in the hotel, listening to her talk. She was sitting up in bed, and I listened to her as she spoke in her beautiful voice, spoke of things which even now I would not dare whisper in the blackest night, though I stood in the midst of a wilderness. You, Villiers, you may think you know life and London and what goes on day and night in this dreadful city. For all I can say, you may have heard the talk of the vilest. But I tell you, you can have no conception of what I know. Not in your most fantastic, hideous dreams can you have imaged forth the faintest shadow of what I have heard and seen. Yes, seen. I have seen the incredible such horrors that even I myself sometimes stop in the middle of the street and ask whether it is possible for a man to behold such things and live. In a year, Villiers, I was a ruined man, in body and soul. In body and soul. But your property, Herbert, you had land in Dorset. I sold it all. The fields and woods, the dear old house, everything. And the money, she took it all from me. And then left you? Yes, she disappeared one night. I don't know where she went, but I am sure if I saw her again, it would kill me. The rest of my story is of no interest. Sordid misery, that is all. You may think, Villiers, that I have exaggerated and talked for effect, but I have not told you half. I could tell you certain things which would convince you, but you would never know a happy day again. You would pass the rest of your life as I pass mine. A haunted man. A man who has seen hell. Villiers took the unfortunate man to his rooms and gave him a meal. Herbert could eat little, and scarcely touch the glass of wine set before him. He sat moody and silent by the fire, and seemed relieved when Villiers sent him away with a small present of money. By the way, Herbert, said Villiers, as they parted at the door, what was your wife's name? You said Helen, I think. Helen what? The name she passed under when I met her was... Helen Vaughan, but what her real name was, I can't say. I don't think she had a name. No, no, not in that sense. Only human beings have names, Villiers. I can't say any more. Goodbye. Yes, I will not fail to call if I see any way in which you can help me. Good night. The man went out into the bitter night and Villiers returned to his fireside. There was something about Herbert which shocked him inexpressibly. Not his poor rags, nor the marks which poverty had set upon his face, but rather an indefinite terror which hung about him like a mist. He had acknowledged that he himself was not devoid of blame. The woman, he had avowed, had corrupted him body and soul and Villiers felt that this man, once his friend, had been an actor in scenes evil beyond the power of words. His story needed no confirmation. He himself was the embodied proof of it. Villiers mused curiously over the story he had heard, and wondered whether he had heard both the first and the last of it. No, he thought, certainly not the last. Probably only the beginning. A case like this is like a nest of Chinese boxes. You open one after the other and find a quainter workmanship in every box. Most likely Herbert is merely one of the outside boxes. There are stranger ones to follow. Villiers could not take his mind away from Herbert and his story. 
which seemed to grow wilder as the night wore on. The fire seemed to burn low, and the chilly air of the morning crept into the room. Villiers got up with a glance over his shoulder, and, shivering slightly, went to bed. A few days later he saw at his club a gentleman of his acquaintance, named Austin, who was famous for his intimate knowledge of London life, both in its tenebrous and luminous phases. Villiers, still full of his encounter in Soho and its consequences, thought Austin might possibly be able to shed some light on Herbert's history. And so after some casual talk, he suddenly put the question, Do you happen to know anything of a man named Herbert? Charles Herbert? Austin turned round sharply and stared at Villiers with some astonishment. Charles Herbert? Weren't you in town three years ago? No? Then you have not heard of the Paul Street case? It caused a good deal of sensation at the time. What was the case? Well, a gentleman, a man of very good position, was found dead, stark dead, in the area of a certain house in Paul Street, off Tottenham Court Road. Of course, the police did not make the discovery. If you happen to be sitting up all night and have a light in your window, the constable will ring the bell, but if you happen to be lying dead in somebody's area, you will be left alone. In this instance, as in many others, the alarm was raised by some kind of vagabond. I don't mean a common tramp or a public-house loafer, but a gentleman whose business or pleasure, or both, made him a spectator of the London streets at five o'clock in the morning. This individual was, as he said, going home. It did not appear whence or whither, and had occasion to pass through Paul Street between four and five a.m. Something or other caught his eye at number twenty. He said absurdly enough that the house had the most unpleasant physiognomy he had ever observed. But at any rate, he glanced down the area and was a good deal astonished to see a man lying on the stones, his limbs all huddled together, and his face turned up. Our gentleman thought his face looked peculiarly ghastly, and so set off at a run in search of the nearest policeman. The constable was at first inclined to treat the matter lightly, suspecting common drunkenness. However, he came, and after looking at the man's face, changed his tone quickly enough. The early bird who had picked up this fine worm was sent off for a doctor, and the policeman rang and knocked at the door till a slatternly servant girl came down looking more than half asleep. The constable pointed out the contents of the area to the maid, who screamed loudly enough to wake up the street. But she knew nothing of the man, had never seen him at the house, and so forth. Meanwhile, the original discoverer had come back with a medical man, and the next thing was to get into the area. The gate was open, so the whole quartet stumped down the steps. The doctor hardly needed a moment's examination. He said the poor fellow had been dead for several hours, and it was then the case began to get interesting. The dead man had not been robbed, and in one of his pockets were papers identifying him as, well, as a man of good family and means, a favourite in society, and nobody's enemy, as far as could be known. I don't give his name, Villiers, because it has nothing to do with the story and because it's no good raking up these affairs about the dead when there are no relations living. The next curious point was that the medical man couldn't agree as to how he met his death. There were some slight bruises on his shoulders, but they were so slight that it looked as if he had been pushed roughly out of the kitchen door, not even thrown over the railings from the street or even dragged down the steps. But there were positively no other marks of violence about him certainly none that would account for his death, and when they came to the autopsy there wasn't a trace of poison of any kind. Of course the police wanted to know all about the people at number twenty, and here again, so I have heard from private sources, one or two other very curious points came out. It appears that the occupants of the house were a Mr. and Mrs. Charles Herbert. He was said to be a landed proprietor, though it struck most people that Paul Street was not exactly the place to look for country gentry. As for Mrs. Herbert, nobody seemed to know who or what she was, and between ourselves, I fancy the divers after her history found themselves in rather strange waters. Of course, they both denied knowing anything about the deceased, and in default of any evidence against them, they were discharged. But some very odd things came out about them. Though it was between five and six in the morning when the dead man was removed, 
a large crowd had collected, and several of the neighbours ran to see what was going on. They were pretty free with their comments, by all accounts, and from these it appeared that number 20 was in very bad odour in Paul Street. The detectives tried to trace down these rumours to some solid foundation of fact, but could not get hold of anything. People shook their heads and raised their eyebrows, and thought the Herberts rather queer, would rather not be seen going into their house, and so on. But there was nothing tangible. The authorities were morally certain the man met his death in some way or another in the house and was thrown out by the kitchen door, but they couldn't prove it, and the absence of any indications of violence or poisoning left them helpless. An odd case, wasn't it? But curiously enough, there's something more that I haven't told you. I happened to know one of the doctors who was consulted as to the cause of death, and some time after the inquest I met him and asked him about it. Do you really mean to tell me, I said, that you were baffled by the case? That you actually don't know what the man died of? Pardon me, he replied. I know perfectly well what caused death. Blank died of fright, of sheer awful terror. I never saw features so hideously contorted in the entire course of my practice, and I have seen the faces of a whole host of dead. And the doctor was usually a cool customer enough, and a certain vehemence in his manner struck me, but I couldn't get anything more out of him. I suppose the Treasury didn't see their way to prosecuting the Herberts for frightening a man to death. At any rate, nothing was done, and the case dropped out of men's minds. Do you happen to know anything of Herbert? Well, replied Villiers, he was an old college friend of mine. You don't say so. Have you ever seen his wife? No, I haven't. I've lost sight of Herbert for many years. It's queer, isn't it? Parting with a man at the college gate, or at Paddington, seeing nothing of him for years, and then finding him pop up his head in such an odd place. But I should have liked to have seen Mrs. Herbert. People said extraordinary things about her. What sort of things? Well, I hardly know how to tell you. Everyone who saw her at the police court said she was at once the most beautiful woman and the most repulsive they had ever set eyes on. I have spoken to a man who saw her, and I assure you, he positively shuddered as he tried to describe the woman, but he couldn't tell why. She seems to have been a sort of enigma, and I expect that if one dead man could have told tales, he would have told some uncommonly queer ones. And there you are again in another puzzle. What could a respectable country gentleman like Mr. Blank, we'll call him that if you don't mind, want in such a very queer house as number 20. It's altogether a very odd case, isn't it? It is indeed, Austin. An extraordinary case. I didn't think when I asked you about my old friend I should strike on such strange metal. Well, I must be off. Good day. Villiers went away, thinking of his own conceit of the Chinese boxes. Here was quaint workmanship indeed. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Great God Pan, Part 1 of 3, by Arthur Mackin. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off anything in the store. Give more and you get more. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs> <laughs>